17th, October, 1946. This morning, Dr. Roy showed before Bhagavan how he writes, reads. I have learned that he is a, with a master's degree from Calcutta University and has afterwards become a PhD at an American university. In the afternoon, when I entered the hall about 3 p.m., Dr. Roy was asking Bhagavan, in the case of persons who are not capable of long meditation, will it not be enough if they engage themselves in doing good to others? And Bhagavan replied, yes, it will do. The idea of good will be at their heart. That is enough. Goodness, God, love are all the same thing. If the person keeps continuously thinking of any of these, it will be enough. All meditation is for the purpose of keeping out all other thoughts. After some pause, Bhagavan said, when one realizes the truth, and knows that there is neither the seer nor the seen, but only the self that transcends both, and that the self alone is the screen or the substratum on which the shadow of both ego and all that sees comes and goes. The feeling that one has not got eyesight and that therefore one misses the sight of various things will vanish. The realized being, though he has normal eyesight, does not see all these things. He sees only the self and nothing but the self. After further discussion with Dr. Roy, Bhagavan added, there is nothing wrong in seeing anything, this body or the world. The mistake lies in thinking you are the body. There is no harm in thinking the body is in you. The body, world, all must be in the self or rather, nothing can exist apart from the self, as no pictures can be seen without the screen on which the shadows can be cast. In answer to a question as to what is the best way to the goal, Bhagavan said, there is no goal to be reached. There is nothing to be attained. You are the self. You exist always. Nothing more can be predicated of the self than that it exists. Seeing God or the self is only being the self or yourself. Seeing is being. You, being the self, want to know how to attain the self. And this is something like a man being at Ramana Ashramam asking how many ways are there to reach the ashram and which is the best way for him. All that is required of you is to give up the thought that you are this body and to give up all thoughts of the external things that are not self. As often as the mind goes out towards outward objects, prevent it and fix it in the self or true I. That is all the effort required on your part. 
The different methods prescribed by different thinkers are all agreed on this. All the various schools agree that the mind must give up thinking of external things and must think of the self or God, as they may call it. And that is meditation. But truly, meditation you will find when you realize the self that what was once the means is now the goal. That while once you had to make an effort, now you cannot get away from the self even if you want. Twenty fourth, November, nineteen forty six. A Mrs. Chenoy from Bombay asked Bhagavan this evening, after she had read Who Am I, whether it was the proper thing to do if she asked herself, Who am I, and told herself she was not this body, but a spirit, a spark from the divine flame. And Bhagavan first said, Yes, you might do that or whatever appeals to you, it will come right in the end. But after some silence, he told her, there is a stage in the beginning when you identify yourself with the body, when you are still having the body consciousness. At that stage, you have the feeling you are different from the reality or God. And then it is, you think of yourself as a devotee of God, or as a servant or lover of God. This is the first stage. The second stage is when you think of yourself as a spark of the divine fire, or a ray from the divine sun. But even then, there is still that sense of difference and body consciousness. The third stage will come when all such difference ceases to exist, and you realize that the self alone exists. There is an I which comes and goes, and another I which always exists and abides. So long as the first I exist, the body consciousness and sense of diversity will persist. Only when that false I dies, the reality will reveal itself. For instance, in sleep, the first I does not exist. You are then conscious of a body or the world no, you are not. Only when that I again comes up, as soon as you get out of sleep, do you become conscious of the body and this world. But in sleep, you alone existed. For when you wake up, you are able to say, I slept soundly. You that wake up and say so are the same that existed during sleep. You don't say that the I which persisted during sleep was a different I from the I present in the waking state. That I which persists always and does not come and go, is the reality. The other I which disappears in sleep is not real. One should try and realize in the waking state that which unconsciously everyone attains in sleep, the state 
where the small I disappears and the real I alone is. At this point, she asked, but how is it to be done? By inquiring from whence and how does this small I arise? The root of all of this, I, it is at the root of all thoughts. And if you inquire wherefrom it arises, it disappears. Am I not then to say, in answer to the who am I question that I put, I am not this body but a spirit? No, the inquiry who am I means really the inquiry within oneself as to where from within the body the I thought arises. If you concentrate your attention on such an inquiry, the I thought being the root of all other thoughts, the rest of the thoughts will be destroyed and then the self or the true I alone will remain as ever. You do not get anything new or reach somewhere where you were not before. When all other thoughts which were hiding the self are removed, the self shines by itself. And then she referred to the portion of the book, Who Am I?, where it said, even if you keep on saying, I, I, it will take you to the self or reality and ask whether that was not the proper thing to be done. And I explained to her, the book says one must try and follow the inquiry method which consists in turning one's thoughts inward and trying to find out where from the I, which is the root of all thoughts, arises. If one finds one is not able to do it, one may simply go on repeating I, I, as if it were a mantra, like Krishna or Rama, which people use in their japa. And I told her the idea is to concentrate on one thought to exclude all other thoughts, and then eventually even the one thought will die. On this she asked me, will it be of any use if one simply repeats I, I mechanically? And I told her, when one uses I or other words like Krishna, one surely has in one's own mind some idea of the God one calls by the name I. When a man goes on repeating Rama or Krishna, he cannot be thinking of a tree as the meaning behind it. After this back and forth discussion with her, Bhagavan said, now you consider you are making an effort and uttering I, I, or other mantrams, and making meditation. But when you reach the final stage, meditation will go on without any effort on your part. You can't get away from it or stop it. For meditation, japa, or whatever else you call it, is your real nature.